Welcome to the Insightful Professor. In this video, we begin a new series that discusses how to introduce brand new data types or user-defined types to an existing database system. This is an idea that goes back many years, but has been incorporated into the ANSI SQL 1999 standard. What we'll be doing is looking at the Oracle database software and looking at how we can extend a relational database to include object-oriented functionality. This would make the database an ORDBMS, or Object Relational Database Management System. So we will be addressing some of the issues related to the complexity and challenges of creating a new set of data types within the existing framework of a relational database system. The material that I'll be presenting in these videos comes from courses that I taught at both the undergraduate and graduate levels uh, years ago. The relational model, the theory on which commercial database products like Oracle Database, IBM DB2, and Microsoft SQL Server are based, was given to us by E.F. Codd around 1969-1970. In the mid-1980s, commercial systems, such as those just mentioned, were adopted by many businesses to support their daily operations. Such databases were quite well suited to deal with dominant data types in use at the time, text and numbers. The programs that worked with the relational database systems were written in procedural languages, such as COBOL, FORTRAN, and C. Over time, object-oriented programming languages started to take off, and that meant these also would have the ability to communicate with relational database products. So languages such as C++ and Java became available as a means of communicating with our relational database products. But this raised something quite interesting as an issue. The idea is that with C++ or Java, these languages already have an extensible type system. It's possible to define new classes so that you can go beyond the basic built-in data types provided by the compiler. So you define the new classes and you instantiate objects. Additionally, we start to think about storing these objects in a database. So programs were developed using object-oriented languages, such as C++ and Java, and it resulted in two vastly different approaches to working with data. While the database management system used one set of data types to describe data entrusted to it, programming languages used a different set of data types and now could create their own new data types. So the questions that we then become confronted with would be, how can such data be stored for future access and manipulation? How could we give persistence to objects that were instantiated from C++ or Java classes? Must it be stored and managed in some kind of a repository separate from the traditional business data? Or could it coexist with that data? That's the idea of what we want to investigate here. It has become possible to take your traditional business data and add to it new data types and objects based upon those new data types and store them together in the same repository, in a single relational database. In fact, in a single object relational database. Historically, there have been two general approaches considered to support objects in a database system. One would be considered a kind of a pure approach to object support. This would be considered an object-oriented database management system, or sometimes just called an object database management system. The other approach was more of a hybrid approach, extending relational systems which could already store traditional business data in the form of text and numbers and allow such systems to add new data types and hence support objects. This is what we're going to be focusing on in our examination, object relational database management systems. When you add new data types to a database management system, 
much more has to be considered than simply adding the data type and creating objects uh, from that type. We have to provide a support framework. Consider what a database management system offers. It offers query processing facilities to support data retrieval, and these queries are written in a language SQL, which is non-procedural, so we state what we want, and it's up to a component of the database called the Query Optimizer to figure out an efficient way to obtain that data and satisfy our request. Well, if we're adding brand new data types that just a moment ago the database system had no knowledge of, it has no pre-built understanding of how to process such data and access it in an efficient manner. The system must be educated with respect to the new data type. This is extended to concurrency control in terms of things like locking and transaction processing. Also for database recovery, for backup and recovery procedures, utilities will have to be adapted with respect to these new data types that previously they had no knowledge of. Database security. Consider that if we're dealing with objects within a database, objects consist both of structure and behavior. That behavior would be executable code. This executable code now no longer resides outside of the database, but resides inside of the database. So we have to consider the implications of executing that code and who might be allowed to execute or invoke such methods. Additionally, data integrity becomes an issue. So at least initially, we will not concern ourselves with these issues. Our interest lies in explaining the feasibility of creating new types and the framework needed to accomplish such definitions. We will consider how the system works to allow us to add these new types. However, keep in mind that if you choose to develop new data types and exploit this object relational capability, then components of the DBMS must be made aware of these new types in order to process them appropriately. As we consider a solution to incorporating user-defined types into a database, we will emphasize the organization and the operation of the database management system which supports such objects. At least initially, we will be less concerned with developing applications that use these types. A little bit of warning here. Although we're shying away from writing code, classes and their objects encapsulate both structure, the fields or the attributes, and the behavior, the methods. The methods constitute code, so design and implementation of a class require code to support the behavior. Although we will attempt to steer clear of writing application code in our discussion, we must address the issue of implementing behavior for any user-defined type we add to our database. To address this coding issue, we will use PLSQL to implement the methods of our types. Now, SQL is the language for relational database to allow us to interact with the database. SQL has been modified or enhanced to support user-defined types. So we will examine changes to SQL that enable us to create new types in the database. There are new data definition statements, create type, create type body, that we will examine. Additionally, we will examine changes to SQL that allow us to access and manipulate persistent data using our new types. So the data that we store in the database, subsequently we would want to retrieve it, will show you how SQL has been adapted to accommodate that. And likewise, when we're doing uh, insert, update, and delete operation, it will show you the effect that object support or user-defined type support has had on data manipulation. So in our investigation, we'll describe the solution to user-defined types as it's been incorporated into Oracle Database. So we're not proposing a new approach to defining types. We're simply examining the idea of what Oracle has 
presented to us, the framework that they've provided. I believe they've done a rather nice job. So we'll introduce some object-oriented concepts along the way because that's going to be necessary to assist viewers in understanding the relevance of a topic. If you're already comfortable with object-oriented programming, you're a step ahead. Now, the approach taken by Oracle is based on some aspects of the ANSI SQL 1999 standard, which address the idea of extensible types. Oracle adopted support for this capability back in version 8.0. And if you go before that, you'll see that other little things were starting to slip in to the relational system that Oracle had, which were kind of paving the way to introduce object-oriented functionality or object relational functionality. After 8.0, major enhancements were added in later releases of the Oracle database product. So we'll be addressing some of those. We'll be using Oracle 18C. Actually, the Express Edition has the capability of working with user-defined types, and that's what we'll use, assuming that that would be more readily available to folks viewing the video. And again, a background in object-oriented programming would be helpful, but not absolutely necessary because I'll try to fill in the voids as we go along. So the topics we expect to address in this series will be user-defined types in a relational database. We'll focus on the structure and talk about some of the challenges of defining new types We'll look at behavior, defining methods. We'll also look at class inheritance, as it applies as well in this framework of user-defined types in an object relational database. And we'll take a look at collections, kind of multi-valued containers, such as v-arrays, variable length arrays, and nested tables, and see how those fit within this framework as well. Now consider the importance of extending the type system of a database. A database already knows how to operate on numbers, add, subtract, multiply, divide. A database already knows how to operate on character strings, performing operations such as concatenate, extract a substring, or locate a substring. But suppose we were developing something like a geographic information system we would need more than simple numbers and strings. In geographic applications, we might need data types such as point, line, polygon, and so on. The operations on these types would include such things as intersection, containment. The point is that the database has no knowledge of these things, but we can educate the system by introducing these new types with the associated behavior. So when objects of these types have been created, we will then need to store them for future use, giving persistence to these. So that's kind of the rationale or the justification behind the topic that we're going to be addressing in these videos. So I hope you'll find this interesting and look forward to it. And if it sounds to be of interest to you, give us a thumbs up right now, let us know, and we'll continue to push forward to get these videos out a little sooner. And thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.